Our reading today is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to chapter 5, 11. And the words, I think, are coming up on the screen. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus, bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we don't, do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Amen. Good morning. What a scripture to be looking at today. I guess um, there will be quite a few of you who have signed up to the Bible Book Club. And you'll know that over the past weeks, We've been looking at this uh, book, 1 Thessalonians, and I think this coming week we're on chapter 4, and obviously followed by chapter 5 the following week. I'm going to be dipping into both, because <laughs> I just couldn't resist it. Um, because in chapter 4, as Liz read, the title in my NIV is The Coming of the Lord. So let's take a look at this together. Just to put this whole book into context, the Thessalonian church was established during Paul's second missionary journey, along with um, Timothy and Silas. And when this letter was written, the church was still in its infancy. It was largely made up of Gentiles, pagans, and some Jews. But as the number of converts grew, so did the opposition. Actually, from the Orthodox Jews, it came. And the opposition was so strong that it forced Paul and his companions to leave. They had done a great job in establishing these new converts in the faith, so much so that the Thessalonian church had become a model to all believers, both in Macedonia and Achaia. Their reputations had become known everywhere. As such, 
they were able to stand the persecution that was coming their way. Paul's concern, however, was to ensure that they would would not become unsettled by this persecution, by the trials that would come along with it, and be tempted to give up on their faith. Paul is so concerned that from Athens, which is where they went, he sends Timothy back to them to see how they're getting on to, and to strengthen and encourage them. And when he gets back to Paul, Paul is really pleased to hear the good news about them. And he wants to write a letter to them, adding his word of encouragement to them, like, well done, you Thessalonians. Keep standing, you're doing a great job. And keep standing, because the day of the Lord is coming. A day when Jesus is going to come back and take them with him into eternity. By standing firm, they are, as Paul writes, destined to salvation. Destined to the eternal life that Jesus won won for them through his death on the cross, where he took the punishment for our sin, and in his resurrection, giving to us the certainty of eternal life. Jesus is coming back. Paul mentions it in every chapter of this letter. It was really important then, and it's really important for us today. For the day of Jesus' return is nearer than it's ever been before. And although this church was well-grounded, like us all on a journey of faith, questions, we have questions, don't we? And we have concerns about things. And so the Thessalonians are sent back a couple of questions for Paul to answer. And this is where we pick up in our reading. Question one. What happens to those who have already died in Christ? Well, Paul reminds them, Jesus died and he was raised to life. Fact. Paul knew that to be true for himself in his own conversion experience. Therefore, when he writes about this, he writes with an absolute certainty that as Jesus had risen from the dead according to the promise of his father to him, so those who have died in Christ will be raised according to the same promise. They will not be left out of this glorious event. In fact, Paul says they're actually going to rise first. But in chapter 5, verse 10, Paul writes, you know, whether we are we have died, or whether we're still alive, when he returns, we're actually going to live together with him in all eternity, united for all time. Question two. How can they prepare for the day of the Lord's coming? Especially in light of the fact that Paul reiterates Jesus' word, the day is going to come like a thief in the night. Suddenly, it's going to be here. Within the whole of this letter, Paul really is saying, keep on doing what you're doing. Keep following the teachings of Jesus. That's how you prepare Just think about when you plan a journey. You get ready for it in many ways, don't you? Especially if it's a holiday. You plan ahead. Sometimes it can be a really quick decision and you're going to go next week. 
Sometimes it's a few months in advance, and I know people who book holidays at least a year in advance, if not a bit more. When you've made the decision on, to go on a journey, there's this sort of protocol you follow. You then have to make the book in. Along the way, you're thinking, what clothes should I take? What footwear do I need? Do I need suntan lotion or a ski jacket? And you obviously need the right currency for the destination you're going to. You only start planning when you've made the decision to go. It's the same with our spiritual lives. If we want to get to heaven, if we want that to be our eternal destination, then we each have a decision to make. The Bible tells us that it's only through believing, and that is a personal decision that we each have to make, so it's only through believing and committing your life to Jesus that you can get to heaven. Know yourself, as Paul writes, appointed to salvation. Today, you can make that decision. And if that decision is yes, then you can know the certainty of your decision today, right now, in the here and now. Not something you have to wait for. It's something that can happen now. Having made the decision, you can then enjoy packing your life with all the good things that Jesus has come to give to you and start getting ready for the day of the Lord's return and for eternity. You notice that Paul mentions that we were not appointed to suffer wrath, but salvation. Meaning there will be some that are appointed to wrath. People who have chosen by an act of their will, to walk away from Jesus rather than towards him. And let me just say at this point, only God knows. Only God knows. Wrath is not a word we use in church very often, if at all. But it's one that's used throughout the Bible. And I just felt it right today to look at it. No matter how uncomfortable it makes us feel, it is in the word of God. And it does. It has made me feel uncomfortable as I've been putting this sermon together. What is wrath? Well, the definition hasn't changed from when it was written here in Thessalonians, this letter. It means fury, anger, displeasure, rage, punishment. It's not a very nice picture, is it? At its worst, there are some people who get so angry that they lose it. You know, we say their blood's boiling. Their faces are as red as can be. And if you watch cartoons, you know, you've got steam, they've got steam coming out of their ears. They lose control both of what they say and how they express it. Their rage drives them to uncontrollable words and actions. That's how human anger can express itself at its worst. But that's not how God expresses his anger. He is so far and above our imagination that he has the ability to hold a settled position on sin. 
One where his anger is held in balance alongside all his other attributes of truth, justice, love, mercy, compassion, faithfulness. God can never be driven by rage, unlike human beings. God can never lose control so far and above what we can imagine him to be. You see, this unchanging God from the foundation of the world to this 21st century has made it clear that nothing unholy, impure, immoral, wicked, evil can enter his kingdom cannot enter eternity. So on that day, when Jesus returns, those who have determined to live their lives in such an ungodly manner, those who have rejected him and his offer of salvation, will bear the consequences of their decision. God's justice is perfect. And in standing in his presence, they will know themselves to be rightly convicted of their sin and rightly deserving of the sentence of eternal death. It grieves Jesus to do this. Because he longs, Jesus came that none should be lost. That's his heart. But he has to be true to himself. As a parent who has consistently warned their child, if you carry on doing this, that or the other, there will be consequences, there is a punishment for what you've done wrong. So God has warned mankind. In the same way it grieves a parent's heart to carry the punishment out, so it grieves God. He takes no pleasure in it. For God so loves all he created, every human being, And as John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that all who believe in him should inherit eternal life. For he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save it. That's his heart. I read in a commentary recently that the God who demands allegiance is the one who has met their needs. The Lord has done something for them before he asks anything of them. That's us. Romans 5 puts it succinctly. The Lord demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we ever knew anything about Jesus, he had done something for us. And all he asks, in light of what he has done for us on the cross, all he asks is that we live a life worthy of him. It's not much of an ask, is it? Paul tells us we belong to the light and as such we should live as children of the light. We need to be lights in this dark world. In chapter 4 Paul says we instructed you how to live in order to please God. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. 
For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. What Paul had taught were not his own rules and regulations, not his own ideas. They were God's commands. They were and they remain God's commands. And so today, we should pay attention to them. If we want to know what God's ways are, we have the Bible. We need to read it. We need to understand it. We need to meet together and grapple with the issues in it. And then we need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and help us to live in line with it. Paul wants the Thessalonians, as he wants us to, to be examples to those around us, to be alert, to be self-controlled, and not like those who get drunk at night and then the following day nurse headaches and bad stomachs regretting things that they think they might have done, but they're not quite sure. That is not how we are called to live. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Matthew Henry, commentator, reminded me as I was preparing that all uncleanness is contrary to the nature of God all uncleanness. Were the Thessalonians perfect? They were not. Are you and I perfect? We are not. But like them, we have a responsibility to live out our lives according to the teachings of Jesus. Jesus himself said, It's not enough to be a hearer of the word. Or actually today, even a reader of the word. It's not enough. We need to be doers of it also. There were some in the Thessalonican church who, because they thought Jesus' return was going to be imminent, had actually given up work. They'd put their feet up And they were living off their brothers and sisters in Christ. Not honouring to God, Paul says. And he tells them that they should get back to work so that they may win the respect of outsiders and not be dependent on anybody. They are to be models of Christ. You know, there was always a danger that in their idleness of work, they would become idle in their spiritual life too. It's a danger. Jesus is coming back. What's the point of going to church? What's the point of praying? What's the point of me doing this, that or the other? Jesus is coming back. So I'll just sit back and wait. No, says Paul. Just keep on. Keep on doing what you're doing. Jesus was always about his father's business, even to his death on the cross. Therefore, as followers of Jesus, we too are to carry on until he returns or until we die. No wonder Paul finishes this letter with a word that we are to encourage one another, build each other up, asking the Holy Spirit to fill us, because it's only through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we will be made holy, that we will be enabled to live a life worthy of God, a life expressing the same character of God. 
And Paul finishes with this awesome prayer which he can pray over us today. He says to us all, may God himself sanctify you through and through that your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Sanctify means to be set apart. Set apart to be the image of Christ. I wonder if today we're ready to make yet another commitment to him to do that. Or maybe if you haven't given your life to Christ, you might want to do that today. Christ has done much for us, much more than we can think or imagine, much more than we experience I pray God will grant us to be open to him that his image may become more and more apparent to the world in which we live. I'm going to just spend a, a couple of minutes in quiet so you can respond to Jesus with whatever has touched you today. In, if this is going to be the first time you've made a commitment to Christ, you know, there, there is no pattern of words that we need to say. Jesus responds to you as you. But you can tell him that you've recognised that you have need of him in your life. You can invite him into your life, commit your life to him, because with that will come the assurance of your sins forgiven and of new life lived out with him. And if this is the umpteenth time you've chosen to make a commitment, you'll just know what to say. So let's just have a couple of minutes of quiet for you to be with Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have met with us. You have heard our words unspoken and even thought of, and that you will now take us on the next step of our journey. For that, we give you thanks and praise. Amen.
we're going to sing. We're going to sing the old rugged cross, a most beautiful hymn. And as we sing, there's going to be a member of the prayer team, one this side and one this side, who will be um, willing to anoint you with oil, with the sign of the cross. If it helps you to make a commitment or a recommitment to Christ in that way, please make use of the prayer team. There will be no prayer said, no word shared, simply the sign of the cross, and then you can return to your seats. If that is helpful to you as we sing these, please do so. Carla. <laughs> 